Yeah. So I was just asking you about the, I guess it's called phases of one's life. No? Right, rites of passage. Rites of passage, okay. So uh, in the African system, what system, uh, what other systems are, are, are there out What systems are there out there that you know of? Right, and in Yoruba, Akan, and most of the systems in Africa, they deal with a primary five. The rights when birth, when you come to birth. Come to birth. And the rights when you reach puberty, okay. when you're being prepared for adulthood. The rights of adulthood, once you, is that's between the 20s and about 50. And then, and, and somewhere, then both of deal with the five. And then the eldership, which is between 60 and 75. And the last is the preparation for ancestorship. So those are the primary five. But in between, you have secondaries. So when you're talking about the puberty, where you're being prepared for adulthood, there is that entry into the community of adulthood. But when you get 30, you're being prepared to take responsible senior positions as an adult. And when you're in your 50s, you're being prepared to take the junior elder role so that when you reach eldership, you're taking on the responsibility of the community to be a counselor, to be a guide, to be the historian. All of these elements are the part of what your function has to be. You're the conflict resolution persons in the community. And of course, that last one is always to prepare to be an ancestor. And that's a process where you go through a lot of rituals, where you begin to listen to the elders in the community on what messages you're supposed to take home to the ancestors about the condition of their children and let them know what our efforts are but what our needs are and to make a major request on whom they should send back what type of person needs to come back to handle the problems we are facing oh so, so because because you because you're here you can you can give them the update information that's, on that's who, right. what's needed that's right and all african systems have a um, what do you call it, the word um, when you go and you come Oh. Reincarnation. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And in all the systems I know, I don't know all of them, but the Yoruba, the Akan, Voodoo, so forth, you only reincarnate as a human in the family you initially came to Earth in. You don't come back as a, a tree or a bird or in another family in a foreign place. You come back in the family you left. But you come back as a higher spirit with another level of consciousness, depending on whether you truly develop. Now, in the Yoruba, for instance, they got a concept called Awu. Awu. Awu means we go and we come. And you have eight times to be born as a human being. I'm sorry, seven times to be born as a human being into the family you originally came in. And each of the seven coming and going, you have eight steps of ethical moral development you must complete to be an Orisha. Of course, most people never make it to Orisha, but you become reverent ancestors who go and come with messages of development for your people, for your community, for your family. And in that cycle, when you don't complete it, you go back to the realm of the ancestors where everything is reorganized so your destiny can be refashioned and you can come back again with another set of responsibilities. So when you when you say you come back as an Orisha or a selected head, does that mean you, you were born, say for instance you were born into if a certain... You, if you reach the level of Orisha, you never come back again. Okay. You permanently exist. But now, but that's a lot nature. of people going there. So that means, does, does, does that Orisha house get crowded? What, no, what that very mean? few people make it to the level of the Orisha. Most become reverend ancestors and they constantly go and come helping to raise that family and that community to a higher ethical, moral, principle level so that they become an effective force as a unit in nature. But an Orisha is when you reach perfection. And when you reach perfection, you don't have to go through the cycle again. You become a part of the greater, what we call divinity, and a force in nature itself, which is appealed to by those who are going through the process. Well, that would that would that would make sense because, by definition, at least in my head, you should not be on this planet if you're perfect. 
It's simple, right. simple right. as that. But everything is the struggle towards perfection, but the struggle towards perfection itself is a form of perfection. See? Oh. But when, if one is able to fulfill the task of becoming the perfected one, then you become an expression of an aspect of the divinity that has a permanent place in the guidance of the rest of the universe. You become a force of the nature. Okay, but I have to, uh, again, I, I'm going to stay with this. It would become awfully crowded, so that means that you have to have to transition from my, from, um, from my concept or my concept of being a being to, to become this Orisha, because you no longer become a being. You are almost like absorbed into this concept of Orisha. No, was you, you, right. you no longer and Arisha is a force of nature. Oh, okay. Every force of nature has multiple aspects with no limit to the multiplicity. The wind has multiple aspects. You can't define the wind by one definition. You know? Because the wind have all of these different types of manifestation. All forces in nature does. And so you simply add to that force and represent that element of the force. For instance, Shango, most people talk about Shango as being the king and he carries an axe and he's a warrior. But Shango represents the courage within any individual when he recognized the need to raise himself to a higher spiritual being. The courage that it takes to not only realize that, but to make that step, that leap. That's Shango. The war that Shango is fighting is against the negative qualities and attributes within the human character that blocks us from seeing the possibility of a positive developmental path, ethically and morally. So if you can conquer that, you are a king. You are a warrior. But once you do that, you must marry Oya. Oya is the wind. She's the feminine. What is the wind? Once you realize the need for change, the need for change must marry change. The wind is change in process. So the metaphor of an Oya and a Shango is a metaphor about forces of nature, both within the human anatomy and without the human anatomy, that has a relationship to one another. And then Oya has to marry Ogun. Ogun is the god of iron, the god of steel, the god of war. But what does that represent? Iron comes about when you take a rock, what they call the ore, put it in a fire, heat it to a certain temperature, cause transformation to produce this thing called steel, which has this multiple utility. So the desire, the desire and the recognition for change marries change and then change becomes polyandry and marries transformation that comes as a result of change. They're all forces in nature, but remember the human anatomy is a replication of the, the greater nature. So the force exists, but the force must be cultivated. It doesn't just manifest. You must cultivate the force. You know? Well, if we're going to talk about that cultivation of the force, then that means that the uh, us, uh, uh, let's say that the, these people on the planet today, whatever stripe they are, then we're in serious trouble because we we, 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 keep, we keep, keep on being disrupted from that from those missions, from those those rites of passages. Everybody that you see simply represents possibility. But if possibility don't realize, they just recycle to again represent possibility that might be realized. But if we constantly recycle this 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 morass that we're in, then 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 we by definition it remains a morass. You know, the one thing you've got to remember in the African systems, even though we are overlaid by a lot of European what they call paradigms today, there is no good, no bad. There's no right, no wrong. There's only what's appropriate. And the appropriation is about harmony and balance. You can't possibly have harmony without having what we call bad and what we call good, both being at its optimum. The problem we have is when we can't tell the difference between the two and we think one is supposed to outweigh the other. No. It's the equilibrium you're struggling for. You can't even define your good without the presence of what you've defined as being bad. You know? 
It's like an ancient Kevin. They talk about um, Seth, and they talk about his brother Haru. People over here in the West ain't Seth is evil and Haru is good. No, if you study Kemet, Seth is just the other possibility. One possibility defines the other possibility. And so if you ever see a statue of Ramses, you'll see Haru, representative of all the positive aspects of um, Asar, standing on one side of Ramses, that is the, the level of Ramses, the greatest of great, and on the other side is Set. So he, Ramses cannot be a balanced king and a pharaoh without having an equal amount of Set and an equal amount of Haru. That's what creates my art. Otherwise, whichever way we think he's leaning, he's out of balance, and he cannot create harmony. He can only replicate conflict.